Let's talk about agency. Look, see, I circled it. Isn't that cool? It's going to help you. So um, we're going to talk about obviously the difference between employees and independent contractors, how the agency relationship arises, and then the duties that agents and principals owe to each other. And that's probably as far as we'll get today. And then next time we're going to do a group discussion. Next week we're going to do the second part of chapter 17. And in that we'll talk about um, liability and we'll talk about the termination of the agency relationship. So I think that's Today we're going to cover about pages 488 to 498, I think. So I added a little to this slide, right? Agency equals principal and agent. I said, as the agent deals with third parties. And um, agency is important because without it, we can only deal with one party at a time in one place. So in order for corporations to be national or international, they have to be able to deal in multiple locations simultaneously. And notice the last bullet, one of the major principles of agency, principles, PLE, of agency, is that the principal controls the agent in matters that relate to the agency. Think of that in terms of your employment. Anybody have a boss? Does the boss tell you what to do? Do they ever tell you to do things that aren't part of your job? All right. So go back to them and say, that's not within my agency relationship. No, don't say that. But, you know, that's the, the general idea is that they're supposed to control your work as it relates to um, what they've asked you to do. And then we'll talk about different levels of control when we talk about employees versus independent contractors. So we mentioned this when we were talking about what an agency is. It is a fiduciary relationship, which basically means a trust relationship. Anybody ever heard of the power of attorney? Right. Um, if you give somebody power of attorney, that means they have power to do lots of things on your behalf. This is a, a, a temporary wall that's been here for about 20 years or so. <laughs> Actually, there's a, a gap in the end there. Um, anyway, so if you're going to give someone a lot of power to contract for you, sell your property, buy things, uh, you want to make sure it's somebody you trust, right? In fact, are you just going to give somebody blanket authority to go at, out and act for you when you can act yourself? Probably not. Even e even when, um, when my wife and I were doing a real estate closing, she gave me the authority specifically to represent her at that closing for particular things. And she trusts me. So um, in terms of power of attorney, that's probably something you want to give somebody when you can't act yourself. Like what might be a situation where you can no longer act for yourself, so you want someone else to do it for you. Right. You get in a position where you can't make your own decisions anymore. You're, um, for some reason, you've got diminished capacity or you're in a what they call persistent vegetative state. You can't make your own decisions. Someone else can make them for them. In that case, you can't control them. You better make sure it's somebody that you can trust. So an agent uh, is either an employee or an independent contractor. And on the next slide, we talk about what's the difference. And there's a number of factors here. Anybody got a guess? as to what is the single most important factor on that list. The first one, right? We already said that. Watch me circle it. And I should change my color here. Okay. Anyway. OK, 
control. Right? That's the number one thing that determines whether somebody is an independent contractor or an employee. Like um, when I go by a construction site, I often wonder out loud, are those employees or are those independent contractors? They might be either ones, right? So using our handy dandy checklist, I always have that taped to my dash, just in case I need to refer to it. How are we going to determine what they are? Because we can't necessarily just look at them and go, oh, somebody's exercising a high degree of control over them. But what would we, how would we go about figuring out which they are? So we watch them for a while. <laughs> See, that's one of the factors. I think that's a little insulting, too. Like if, if I asked earlier if you're employees, if you are, you don't have any skills. If you're an independent contractor, you're a higher degree skill. So, I mean, I suppose that's a hint. Like on a construction site, if you see someone come in and do really nice cabinetry work, maybe they're hired to do that type of work because the builder doesn't do that. Um, right, so if you notice, like there's people on the job who seem to be directing that person what to do, when to show up, when to take their breaks, how to do their work, that's a real strong sign as to what they are. Um, what did they drive up in? Did they drive up in a company truck or did they have their own truck? What did they bring in with them? Did they have their own tools or did the um, company provide the tools? Now certainly it's possible that you can, you know, it could be a mix of those. You have your own tools but you left them on the job site, whatever. So, How do they get paid? Well, how do independent contractors usually get paid? Anybody ever been an independent contractor? Yeah? When? When did you get paid? <clears throat> right. So they asked you to do some work, and they wanted to make sure you did it. And then when you did it, they paid you. So, um, again, you know, notice there's a question mark there. You might be an independent contractor and get paid regularly. Like, as an attorney, uh, people hire me, and I... Um, I'm an independent contractor. They don't tell me how to practice law. That's why they come to me, because they don't know how. Right? Or they're not licensed to do it. And so, uh, what do you think? Do you think I spend months and months doing work for them and then wait till I'm all done and then ask them to pay me? No. I mean, attorneys sometimes ask for money up front, and then as they expend money on behalf of their client, they seek reimbursement from their client for that, and then they bill them. So um, I haven't done that kind of work in a while, but I would bill my clients monthly. And then at the end, they had an outstanding balance because of a trial or whatever, then I sent them my final bill. So I could be an independent contractor and get paid regularly. Before I was an attorney, I was a financial planner, which is a fancy way of saying um, I sold insurance and securities. I, I got a commission off of doing that. and um, Which is coincidentally why I went to law school, because I didn't like selling products where if, I, if somebody wanted this one, I made money, and if they, something else was better for them, I didn't make any money. So I decided to go do it on a fee basis. Um, anyway, I worked for a place where you walked in the door, and it was a huge place. And there were financial planners in these offices all the way around the central reception area. When somebody came through that door, it had one name across the door. And they might believe that all the offices were employees, but none of us were. We rented out space, and then we paid the, the reception area in the middle to do our support work for us. Now, why... Um, why would a company want to independently contract with financial planners instead of putting them on staff? Right, benefits is a big one. It costs a lot of money to provide benefits. So we, if we wanted disability or life or anything like that, we bought our own products. 
but what else? Why? Right. Right. The liability is the big one. Like if we're out there giving people advice and we mess it up, we better carry our own malpractice insurance. And it shouldn't be their responsibility. So this table is a an example of how the court kind of weighs these factors to determine which one somebody is, but it's not like a scoring system. Well, you got three over here, two over here, um, one in the middle. And um, sometimes the court will go against what the parties try to say the relationship is. Was there an example of that in your chapter? I'm trying to remember. Um, the taxi cab case. I'm trying to remember which case that was an example of. Uh, so that's fairly common too that um, somebody's driving a cab and there's a question as to whether they're licensed or not or who they're working for. And again, if you've got cab drivers out there, at least the cab drivers I know, they kind of drive kind of crazy. You may not want liability for them. You may not want to have to pay taxes for them. You may not want to pay their benefits. And then when they wreck or cause injury to something, who do you think whoever got injured is going to sue? Everybody, the company, right? Whose name's on the side of the cab or whatever, they're going to sue everybody. And the company is going to say what? We didn't control their work. We're, they're, they're independent contractors. Uh, sometimes the law can say, yeah, maybe you say that, but you treated them as if they were your employee. There was a case involving an auction service. I was mentioning auctioneers earlier where an estate hired an auction service to do work for them. And then the personal representative for the estate stepped in and started telling the auction service what to do. And as a result of the personal representative telling everybody what to do, the court said when somebody got hurt that it was really the personal representative's fault and the auctioneer was working as an employee. Think of it this way. If you roof, roof leaks, you got a couple options. What are they? Yourself, right. You get up there. You know what you're doing. You fix it. If not, you got to hire somebody. You hire an independent contractor. You hire an independent contractor to shingle your roof. And then what do you do? You let them do it. You know, don't tell them how to do it. You know, get up there and tell them where to put the shingles. A Shingle, uh, big bundle of shingles rolls off the roof, falls on someone's head. You don't want it to be because you told them what to do. Right? That's their responsibility. If they don't do the job, well, I mean, does it make sense if you're going to entrust somebody to fix something? You don't tell them how to do it because if, if they follow your direction, they might mess it up. Like uh, when I I hired an electrician, electrician's license. If I tell them to do something that's a violation of code, what should they do? Not do it. They're required to adhere to code. And if they don't, then they could be responsible for that. All right. So... The reason why we're making a big deal about this is because, yeah, here's the case, case 17-1. And the question was, it really came down to what kind of liability um, they would have. Tax liability, contract liability, or tort liability. Anybody ever got a 1099? You shook your head earlier and said you're an independent contractor. You probably did. A 1099 is a little love note at the end of the year that says, hey, we told the IRS we paid you money, but we didn't take any taxes out of it. So you better pay the taxes. So if you didn't plan for that, that can be a little harsh at the end of the year. 
uh, especially if you made more money than you thought you were going to make. If uh, somebody is your employee, then you, the employer, are responsible for withholding taxes, which you may not want the hassle of doing. Contract liability. Well, this is kind of a tricky one. We we're kind of talking about this earlier in terms of who you are in an organization. And not to pick on uh, Meyer, but is the person who's um, scanning groceries at the checkout probably the person who's authorized to enter into contracts for all Meyer stores? Probably not. I suppose it's possible. I was watching Undercover Boss the other day. Ever seen that show? It's an awesome show. Like the CEO of a corporation goes undercover and bags groceries or something and then works with all these other employees and they're like just talking, disclosing anything about the company like the guy that runs this place is a real jerk or whatever. And, oh, yeah, yeah, tell me more. So anyways, it's in interesting. You never know. Your boss could be undercover. Um, so the question is, who is authorized? So is the um, person who's working at the cash register an agent of Meyer? Yeah, it's not, not really that difficult. If we look at our definition, they're not Fred Meyer. They're, they're, they're working on behalf of the employer as an employee, and they are dealing with the customer. So they meet the definition of an agent, but not all agents have the contractual capacity to bind the principal to certain contracts. You can bind the principal to the contract to sell groceries, but not other things. What about the supervisors of the agents? Yeah, that's a good question, especially if you're thinking about the group discussion. So right now we've been talking about you working for another person. But in a corporation, let's just use Meyer as an example. There's a lot of employees. And there's um, a CEO, and then there's some managers. I'm sure there's more to their structure than this. And then there's, um, you mentioned, the clerk. Well, if this is an employee, Is the manager an employee? Yeah. Is the CEO an employee? In most cases, yeah. So who's the employer? My. When you put it that way, who's the principal? My. There's only one P. So if you, if you try to tell me, well, the manager is a principal and an agent because they direct others how to do their work. No. Who are they directing for? Meyer. So some of these employees, let's say, um, I don't know, who, who in Meyer may not deal with the public? Stockers, we'll call them. Right? Probably another name, but like if, if you walk, if you caught him in the middle of the night stocking and ask him a question, they they ignore you. Like they wouldn't even deal with the public. They just would. so um, you know they got headphones in. They're gonna completely ignore you. They're not gonna deal with the public at all. They're not gonna deal with suppliers. They're just gonna put stuff. Maybe they're working in the back room. This person works for someone else, they're an employee, but they're not an agent, right? So you might have multiple employees that all work for one employer, and they may be agents, they may not. Manager. Is the manager an agent? Good chance, right? What happens when something's wrong in Meyer and you can't get help? What do you do? All right, manager, I need a manager, and here comes the manager, right? They deal with people, they deal uh, with suppliers, they deal with um, other things. 
CEO, certainly an agent, right? I don't think you can be a CEO and Meyer without dealing with somebody outside the organization. So did that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. But what happens if the supervisor only deals with the employees and no customer? Right. So, so then they are a employee. Okay. They're a supervisor, but they're not an agent. You're not an agent by representing other employees and you know dealing with other employees inside the organization. But they're um, contracted workers. They'd be a third party. Ah, person. so that can come up too. Let's say there's this guy, we'll call him Fred. Not this Fred, another Fred. So Fred, I. Actually, I, I had this happen before. I went in, I, maybe I've mentioned this to you guys, I go into Best Buy and I'm looking at printers. And along comes somebody and says, you don't want that printer, you want this printer over here. Oh, well, tell me about it. And they're like, da -da -da -da. you know, they're going on and on. I'm like, wow, this is the greatest printer ever. And they realize, you got a special little vest on, a little name tag on. They're not an employee. They're a friend. They're an independent contractor. Now, the question is, that person who's talking to me, who do they work for, right? Because they seem to be in Best Buy trying to sell me the customer. So it almost seems as if they're representing Best Buy as they deal with the public. But instead, that's not what they're doing. They're actually an agent for who? Canon somebody else. Okay. So just because you see somebody in the corporate setting, first thing is you don't even know if they're an employer or independent contractor. And, and sometimes they're wearing a little vest so you know. Other times they're not. Uh, and then the question is, who are they actually representing? Why is that important? Because the, in the scenario I gave you, um, who do they have to be loyal to? They're not there in your interest trying to give you advice as to what's the best printer to buy. They're there acting as an agent on behalf of somebody to get you to purchase their employer's printer. So did that answer your question? All right. And then tort liability. This is a big one. Employers are liable if their employees commit torts within the scope of their employment. In fact, um, uh, I'm going to add course and scope of employment. And let me tell you the difference between the two. Course means during the time you do what you do. So it's certainly possible that you're doing what you do on your job, but you're doing it somewhere else, not during the hours where you typically do it. Right. And then the scope of employment has to do with what it is that you're doing. So give me a scenario. So pizza delivery is pretty broad. Okay. So the Domino's pizza drivers? Yeah. Okay. So if in response to a customer's request for a pizza, they get in their car and drive. That is during their employment, uh, even though it's their own vehicle. And they're doing what they do. They're, they, they deliver pizza. Pretty straightforward. What kind of things wouldn't be during the course of their employment? Certainly not something that is within the scope of what they do. Right. And could they be make could they be delivering pizza and it's not during the course of their employment? I mean, could they do doing exactly what they do on their job but not for their employer during 
when they usually do it. Call that moonlighting, right? I don't know, pizza might be a bad example. I don't know how many pizza moonlighters there are, but what would be a better example? Police officer in a bar, security, right? They hurt somebody, they shoot somebody. Does the uh, municipality have liability for that? Where were they? When were they there? What were they doing? They were doing something just like what they do on the job. But they weren't doing it when they would do it. They were off duty, clearly, somewhere where they wouldn't typically be. You can blur the lines when you're moonlighting someplace where you also work. This can, it can kind of get challenging. All right, so think of any scenario. Think about employees doing things on the job that they shouldn't be doing. I know you guys would never do that. Forklift races, nail gun fights. I'm trying to remember, um, you know, cart races out in the parking lot. Um, do what? Uh huh. Oh yeah. Oh, nice. Racing, awesome. Anything else? I'm in. I won't say on the recording who you are. But. Yeah. So those type of things happen, and you know what? Employers say don't do that. But if in the course and scope of your employment you're out joyriding in the golf, you know you're a caddy or whatever, and you're off in the golf cart doing things with it, then and you harm somebody or harm yourself, your employer would have liability for that. I have a friend who um, drives truck. If he gets a ticket, he's fired. And why do you think that is? Well, they don't want to pay for it, I'm sure, but even bigger than that. Liability. If, if, if he's shown to be an irresponsible driver and then something worse happens, then somebody might say they knew that he was a risk and they didn't do anything about it. So as soon as your driver's somewhere they're not supposed to be, doing something they're not supposed to do. Um, here's a tough one, work for hire. So independent contractors do a job for somebody. Say, for example, um, I develop software. I don't, but let's say I do. And somebody hires me. Does the software I develop belong to them or me? What'd you say? It belongs to me? They paid me to do it and it's mine? Um, they, paid you they paid me to develop the software for them. I mean, make, why would they pay me to develop software for myself? But isn't that what I do? I mean, on a, on a job by job basis. Now I go somewhere else. They're hiring me because I have skills in this. And they've heard that I do that kind of work, whatever it is. Like the company, um, you know, the online student center uses uh, PeopleSoft. So there's consultants that do that kind of work. They go do that same work for others. Who owns what they do? So you know, sometimes that's considered a work for hire. How are you going to... How are you going to resolve that? Because I'm, you know, if I develop the code myself, it's in my brain, it comes out, I might want to go somewhere else and do the same thing for someone else. How are you going to figure out who owns it? That's right. So, word to the wise, if you ever hire someone to do something for you, don't assume that whatever they do for you belongs to you and not them. They might just take it might leave it with you because you paid for it, but they might take it somewhere else too. All right, so agency relationships are, and we mentioned when we we're trying to figure out what a relate agency was, we mentioned several of these factors. It's consensual. You're not involuntarily fo forced into an agency. And there isn't consideration required. Often is paid. Like, people sometimes do things for nothing, but they don't like to do a lot of that. 
<laughs> I like to earn a living. And um, you mentioned that the agent doesn't have to have contractual capacity. I mean, th think of a simple example of um, a house. Let's see if I can draw the house on here. A little door in there. Or you can get a little fireplace. And this is the seller. Here comes a buyer. Who's this? No, that was the agent. Right. So they're going to greet the buyer here and they're going to show them the house. Right. That person could be, as we were saying earlier, not competent. Right. I, I actually I tried to sell my house in Kalamazoo myself. Not fun cleaning it every week, people walking through the house telling me how wonderful it was, but never making an offer. And the reason for that was that when I tried to sell my house, as soon as I tried to put my house on the market, up John, used to be, I mean, it's pharmacy or whatever it is now, used to be up John, went under, downsized, and everybody in my neighborhood put their house up for sale, lower than mine. So I sat for a year waiting for someone to make an offer. There's larger homes right in my neighborhood that were cheaper. So I decided to hire one of these, an agent. And the way I figured it out was one day a um, young, aggressive woman came in with some potential buyers. That fell through. I learned this is fairly common practice with FISBOs for sale by owners. And um, she said, I, I think I can sell your house. And I said, well, let, we'll give it a try. We'll agree you can be my agent. If it doesn't work out. We can agree that either one of us could, could back out of the contract. I'll let you do it for a six-month period to start with. First open house. I'll put a dress on there. She brings mom. Now, typically, it's like um, you bring your son or daughter along to, to train them. and But actually, mom just got her license to start selling real estate, being an agent. And the agent says, I'm busy. I'm going to have my mom sit here and do the open house. So my first experience with this agent is I thought I was getting a young, aggressive, not that I'm discriminating based on age, but yeah. um, uh, experience person, which is usually the flip of what you think. Like the older you are, the more experience you have. But in this case, the daughter had much more experience, and I wasn't getting her. And that continued for a little while, and I said, no, I'm not going to do this. And uh, I found another agent who was able to sell our house. I mean, it turns out it's not a... The skill is kind of important, but what's really important is the person has prospects lined up to buy your house. And so it happened fairly quickly. But mom could be not competent, not highly skilled, whatever. That's not what matters. What matters are the parties to the contract. In the end, the seller's capacity our capacity as the homeowners and the buyer's capacity. Probably should have picked a different color than red, huh? Oops. So, one way an agency is formed is by agreement, express or implied. You guys know what express means by now. It's the third time express contracts expect. Express warranties, now express agency. Either an oral or written agreement that somebody is going to act on your behalf. Or it could be implied. They've, been, they've acted for you before and they continue to act for you. It's implied that they have the authority to act for you. 
or there's certain implied powers that come out of an express agreement. Like in the contract to sell my house, it said the agent has the authority to sell my house for a certain price, yada yada, for a six month period of time. But it didn't say in the contract how often they were required to show it, whether they had permission to put a sign in my front yard, what advertising they would do. They were just required to, to market it. So some of those powers are implied. I mean, if the agent shows up putting a sign in my front yard, I shouldn't run out and say, what are you doing putting a sign in my yard? I should understand it's implied if they're trying to sell my house. One of the things they're going to do is put a sign in my yard. All right, ratification is a little harder. Notice it says, a principal, either by their act or agreement, ratifies, okays, agrees with the conduct of a person who is not, in fact, an agent. So, let's say when I was selling my house, there's something rare or special inside my house that I don't want to sell. What is it? These long, awkward pauses on the recording make people who listen to them wonder what I'm doing. Give me something. What is it that's rare, unique, that I probably don't want to sell? Yes, what is it? A what? A vase? <laughs> awesome. All right, let's see. Have, whoops. Let me try to see if I can change my color here. Neat color. Let's pick something white. That will work better. That will be a little more contrasting, don't you think? So, a vase. We'll even put little flowers on it. Anyway. So, after a year, that was kind of weird. Is it? I put a little flower in it so that that's kind of that's why it's so special. <laughs> so um, I put in the contract, don't sell it. We're desperate to get rid of this house. You could sell anything you want in it, but don't sell that. If we want to, we want to take it with us. Grandma's ashes are in there. I don't know. Along with the flower. So, um, agent tries to sell a house, tries to sell a house, nothing. Then one day, somebody walks through the house, they're like, I'll take the house if you throw in that vase. Now, in the written agreement, it says, don't sell it. So, does the agent have authority to, to do that? No. See up there where it says, not in fact an agent? Well, what that really means is they're, they're not an agent as to the vase. They're not a vase agent. They're a real estate agent. They don't have authority under the contract to sell it. So, they're like, man, this, this thing's been a dog. I haven't been able to sell it. They're willing to give the asking price for the house if I can just throw this in. I think we've got a deal, right? They come back to me. Now, i got a couple choices, right? I can shake them. I told you not to ever sell my vase. Grandma's in there. <laughs> or I could do what? Right, I could ratify it and say, even though you didn't have authority, I'm going to say it's okay anyway. Agency... I, you know, it kind of hurts me that you are. <laughs> no, I couldn't. It's special. No, I mean for the person buying the house. Oh, yeah. A mock vase. I can swap it out. That's right. The old swap mock vase. So, anyway. Um, agency by ratification is agency after the fact. 
It's a way of saying, you didn't have authority, you did it, you went against what I told you to do, but I'm going to say okay anyway. If the agent acts with no authority and their action isn't ratified after the fact, then they're kind of stuck. That's why agents don't want to do things they're not authorized to do, because if they don't have any authority to do it, they might be responsible for it. So we're going to talk more about that when we get into the second part of the chapter in authority. But the way you avoid liability in this scenario up here, the way you're transparent to this transaction is doing things you're supposed to be doing. If you stop off and rob a bank, then you have personal liability for that. All right, so that's agency by ratification. Now the hard one. And you probably, when I say this word, it, it makes you have flashbacks to the RV in our previous group discussion. Agency by estoppel. Estoppel means you're stopped from getting out of your promise. So, um, what would be good an example? Okay, here we go. Put the house back in here. Windows, yeah, that'd be nice. People need to, some sunlight. Need to be able to see it. See out. Anyway, so here comes somebody. They have something that's near and dear to some of you here. A Kirby. And they are selling it, right? Now, Kirby over here has told their agent to get out and sell. But there's one thing I don't want you to do. I don't want you to actually collect the money. You take the order, you bring the order back to us, we ship the vacuum, they pay us. Why don't we want this person to take the cash? Because they believe that's right. There's a couple, well, there's probably many reasons, but the biggies are they're traveling salespeople. They might keep on traveling. Right? You give them a bunch of cash, they might do something with it. Another reason is, and you've probably seen it sometimes, is driver doesn't carry cash. You give them a bunch of cash and they're driving around, some people pay attention to that. So, um, this worked out pretty well until one day a Kirby salesperson comes to my house. And um, I say, I'll take one. Here's the, how much they cost? $5,000? Here's the money. Now, the agent's not supposed to take the money, but they do. And they go back to the principal. Now, what should the principal do? Ratify. Hmm? They, they could, but maybe they shouldn't. Because if they start doing that, then there's really no policy in place, right? Every time somebody brings them back money, they go, oh, that's okay. And then the employees just start doing that. Right? What if Kirby takes the money, ships the vacuum, and cuts a receipt to the customer? Now, what have they led the third party, me, to believe? That it's okay? No one told me anything to the contrary. The salesperson never said anything about it. I gave the money. I got my vacuum. And I got a receipt. So next time, they come with uh, a bunch of attachments. Going to sell you. You need more than vacuum. You need all these other things. So we go, go through the whole thing again. I give them a bunch of cash. This time, the agent goes this way. They run off with the money. So I call up Kirby. Where are my attachments? What are you talking about? 
your agent took my money and you're supposed to give me attachments. We never got your order. That person doesn't even work for us anymore. We fired them. What's the problem? Right, there's, there's an implication that he had the authority to do that or she had the authority to do that and it was okay for me to give them the money. So if you dissect what this says here, it says the principal causes the third person to believe another person is the pr principal's agent and the third person acts to her detriment and, re and reasonable reliance. So in this scenario, the principal leads the third party to believe the agent has authority they don't really have. Is that just like, um, do we have to be money involved? Is that no. just like, um, like the Comcast people are going back trying to do a window and they work, they say they work for Comcast, but when they get the customer back as a window, they offer them all these channels, all these different things, but if they don't when they come to hook it up and they don't give them all those channels, whatever, you call Comcast, they were like, well, that wasn't with us, that was with a different agency or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they have the authority to try to give you all those channels or whatever. You can't put those codes in there. They have to be the one putting them in there. Is they still like... Well, it depends. They, if I understand your scenario, let, you know, let's try it with this one. Instead of, because I said the principal causes the third party to believe something. Your scenario sounds a little different. It's not what the principal did. It's what the agent or alleged agent did. So let's say somebody just shows up at my door one day to sell me a vacuum. They say they represent the Kirby company, but they don't. They take my money and disappear or they promise me extra attachments, or whatever it is, and then they take off and they don't actually deliver it. Then I call Kirby and they're like, that person is not our agent, we don't know who you're talking about. This happens all the time. Um, now the question is, does Kirby have responsibility for what that agent did to convince me to give them money? No, they don't. Think about it. Somebody walks in off the street and says, would you like to buy, I don't know, what is it? I had somebody come in one day and ask, would I like to buy stuffed animals? It seems like around Christmas time, um, when people start getting the shopping fever, people start walking in off the street trying to sell things. And they said, I represent XYZ Company, and we can ship you a whole bunch of these at a very low price. This is what we can do it for. Well, it t you know, it turned out the person didn't work for this company at all. They just had a bunch of ratty stuffed animals they were walking around with trying to sell people and take their money. Well, if, you just, if somebody just says they represent somebody else, does that <laughs> bind the other party to it? Not unless they did something to lead you to believe that person was their agent. Anybody could walk up to you. Anybody could knock on your door and say, I'm from Consumers Power. I'm from the cable company. But what I'm from person, whatever. What if that person came in, said, I'll give you these extra right. attachments for Kirby. Yeah. They really do give you the vacuum, but they never give you the extra attachments that you yes. call Kirby. Yeah. And what would they say about the... Yeah, so that's even a different scenario. Well, what I was giving you is a scenario where somebody says they represent, that they have authority to represent a company and they don't. What yeah, you're, they really do. They really do me, but, but they don't have the authority to do what they did. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you're talking about. All right, so. They just did it to try to get the customer or whatever. Right. Well, the there's a little of that going on. It's a little uh, moonlighting. Right. Even I'll I'll get really wink wink. I'll get you down. these extra channels, whatever. Will they read it down? Do that company really have to give that to them, even if they were a different agency was working for them? 
Well, the answer is always it depends. You know, you can give me all kinds of different sets of facts, but let's let's say I'm, I'm not sure I'm totally following the scenario, but let's say somebody from Direct TV shows up at my door because I invited them there, and they are a representative. They're an agent of Direct TV. They're authorized to do installations. While they're there, they say and they write out on a piece of paper. Well, hey, since I'm here, it looks like you're getting this package. I could hook you up with this, this, and that for this little extra money. Then they do some things behind your TV set and do some things outside. Then they leave, and then you flip on the TV, and they're not there. So then you call DirecTV. I paid for this. I've got something in writing that says that I should get all these things and direct TV says well they are our agent but they have no authority to do that they were trying to get a little money on the side or they were ripping you off or whatever or they're or they're an independent contractor you know we have work we contact some we don't send out employees from our headquarters we contact somebody locally to to do an installation run cable and do whatever so then the question is, which we're going to get to more next time, is what authority did they actually have? Did they have authority to do those type of things? If they didn't, then why should DirecTV be bound to uh, something that they didn't have any authority to do? What I was talking about this slide is if DirecTV did something to lead you to believe that that agent had authority to do those other things, then maybe. But from what the scenario you described, it wasn't it DirecTV. Was it was the agent who wrote something out yeah. and said that. Right? This, is, this is a common thing. People assume that whoever they're dealing with has the authority, and they write out things, and the question is, does that bind the principal? When they didn't know about it, they didn't authorize it. So, right. So, if here's the here's the key difference. Maybe maybe the house scenario would help. Going back to that, agency by ratification is I'm not there during the open house. I found that find out later that the agent sold my vase, and I say, that's okay. Agency by estoppel is, I'm there at the open house. People are walking through, and right there in front of me, by the vase, a buyer says, boy, I'd take the house if that was thrown in. And the agent, right there while I'm standing there, says, yeah, we'll do that. And I don't object. Or I do something like say yes, or I do something to lead the buyer to believe the agent has authority to do that when they don't. So that's the key difference. Principal is there or is the one who's acting to lead the third party to believe something. In ratification, they're not there and they didn't do anything at the time to lead the third party to believe the agent had authority, but later they say that's okay. That makes sense. Okay. So you bring up a good point. It, you know, I'm trying to simplify it, but there are rather complex scenarios that can come up. Like I had refrigerator started making noise. Um, I don't know what the the unit's called that was going out on it, but I like well looking online to trying to find somebody to fix it. I happened to open up the door. If you ever have any problems with the refrigerator, call 1-800-whatever. That's not a real old refrigerator. So I call. They go, we'll send somebody right away. Wow, I called Frigidaire, which, are they even in business anymore? <laughs> yeah, they, they are somewhere, right? And they're like, we'll send somebody right. That's amazing, right? What do they do? Just call somebody locally who does that service. They run around in a van, and they came and fixed my refrigerator. It wasn't an employee of Frigidaire. 
So often you deal with subcontractors who are independent contractors who um, may represent the company, but as they're doing that, they might do something that they're not authorized to do. That's why when you send your employees out to do something for somebody, you better make sure that that's all they do. If they start doing other things, that can be a problem for you. Right. Yeah. So, so let's say that um, you ask AT and T to do some work for you. They send somebody to do it for you, but while they're there, they say you're paying a lot of money for this. I could do it a lot cheaper, and I could add this and that. Well, that's the next thing we're going to talk about is duties that the agent owes the principal. That's a breach of the duty of loyalty. They're not supposed to have their own agents undercutting them. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, hey, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. In fact, there's in your group discussion, there's a scenario about that. Alrighty, now I realize I wrote over top of my next bullet, but um, I'm just trying to figure out this whole sketching thing. Agency by operation of law. Sometimes the law steps in and creates an agency, even though the parties didn't agree to it. Remember when we talked about um, minors could back out of contracts unless it was for necessaries? This is the flip side of that, and that is... If a minor can't pay for the necessaries, the law may impose a burden on whoever is responsible for them to pay. So there are some situations where the law creates an agency. I mean, you think about um, when we talk about quasi-contract and other situations, the law can step in and create an agency relationship when there should be one, even though there isn't. All right, so here's what we're talking about next, duties. First, agent's duties to the principal. So my real estate agent owes a duty to sell my house and to use reasonable diligence and skill to do it. If it's a brain surgeon, they need to use more than a reasonable degree of skill. They need to have special skills equivalent to other brain surgeons or CPAs or doctors or attorneys or whatever it might be. Um, a agent owes a duty to notify the principal. So think about my situation again. If my agent gets an offer on my house, what do they have an obligation to do? Let me know about it, right? And a, uh, a duty of loyalty. They should not be um, saying something bad about me or something contrary to what I've told them to do. There's a there's some companies that advertise if they don't sell your house, they'll buy it. This is real attractive to sellers, especially sellers who've been trying to sell it themselves or it's been on the market a long time. Somebody comes along and says, I agree to buy your house if I can't sell it. Well, usually the, the sale price is significantly lower than they're trying to sell it for. By like saying, if I can't sell your house in this period of time, I'll buy it from you, but I'll give you less. Well, this isn't a problem as long as the agent is loyal. But let's say somebody comes along and says, hey, I'll give you full asking price for that house. What might the agent do? Well, that would be kind of obvious. Buy it from them and then sell it to the person. Right. Wait, not communicate or notify the principal that there is an offer. Buy the house cheaper, turn around and sell it and keep the profit. I'm not saying that's what happens, but there's the potential for that breach of loyalty. Obedience. The agent should do what the principal tells them to do as long as it's within the scope of that agency. 
and then finally accounting. I um, I get the the bar journal every month, and I, I like to look through and see why attorneys get disbarred. It's kind of fun. It's like the National Enquirer of the legal world. And often attorneys get disbarred because they don't account properly for their clients' money. The two big the two big ones are attorneys who get in financial trouble or have substance abuse issues, and they're holding on to closing proceeds, settlements, estates, and they they have that money and they just decide I'm just gonna I'm sure I'm gonna earn it at some point. I'm just gonna use some of it. Or they commingle their funds with their clients' funds. When I was taking client money that didn't belong to me, I put it in trust or escrow. I never put it in my own account. When you do that, that opens you up for the accusation that you're not properly accounting for money. Even when an attorney takes a retainer, what's the retainer supposed to be? Secure future services. They're not supposed to just run out and spend it. Yippee. They're supposed to spend it when they earn it. So agents have a, a duty to account. All right. Oops. Principles, duties to agents. If it's part of the agreement, compensate the agent. And sometimes that's in, in writing, sometimes it's oral, sometimes it's implied. You're doing something for someone else that you would get paid. That's a tough one. A guy was telling me last night that he was standing outside of his church and um, he had a little side business shoveling snow. And um, he walked up to the church and somebody inside the church looked out and he held up his shovel and they went... And he thought that meant, yes, go ahead and shovel everything, and then we'll pay you. <laughs> so he finished shoveling everything, went inside to get paid, and they said, no, I was just waiting. <laughs> he oh I didn't realize that you thought that you were going to get paid for this. I thought you were just helping us out. So it's really a good idea to be clear about when you're going to compensate the agent, when you're not going to. This past weekend, I helped a family move just to help them. I didn't. I mean, what, it, what would it be like if at the end I'm like, okay, pay me. I, I'm $100 an hour. I've been here for how much? When I, when I agreed to do it, we did not talk about me getting paid for it at all. There were other people that were helping too. It wasn't as if we all were getting paid, so it wasn't part of the agreement. But if it is, then it should happen. Um, I sometimes, you know, I talk about the breach of duty of loyalty that agents owe to the principal. Flip side of that is, I've had several people come to me and say, "How can I avoid paying my real estate agent a commission?" Can I? I found a buyer, and yes, my agent has spoke to them or dealt with them. But can I just wait until the contract runs out and then sell them and avoid paying the commission? If you agree to pay a percentage of the sale to somebody, it's a breach of the duty to try to avoid doing that. Although that's arguable. Sometimes agents don't do anything and they want to claim that they earned a commission. Reimbursement. You guys are probably familiar with that, right? If you ever spent money on behalf of your employer and then asked for them to pay you for it? It's not money you're spending on your own. It's for them. So reimbursement has to do with expense. Indemnification is different. It has to do with liability. If an agent acts within the scope of their authority, they are not personally liable. So in that, that scenario where somebody's selling my house, it's not they're not bound to the contract to sell the house. I, the seller, am. But... What if a real estate agent misrepresents something to a buyer and the buyer wants to sue somebody? Who might they sue? Everybody, right? Including the agent. Why would they sue the agent? Why might a buyer of a home sue the agent 
saying that they misrepresented something. Right, because they misrepresented something. You know, they're walking around to the house and the aide says something and later that turns out not to be true and that's the person they've dealt with, so they sue them. I bought this house in reliance on a representation you made to me. It turned out not to be true. The roof leaks. You said it didn't. Now, in Michigan, there's a real estate disclosure form. You're supposed to disclose things like that. Let's say the agent misrepresents the condition of the house based on what the principal told them. Then the agent can go after the principal. That's called indemnification. I was held liable, but it's not really my liability. Now I turn to you and ask you to indemnify me. Pay up. Cooperation. If I didn't want to uh, pay a commission or sell my house when I agreed to, how could I not cooperate as a, as a seller, as the principal? I mean, I could be totally unreasonable, couldn't I? Like if I asked somebody, bring me back this, uh, price under these terms and every time they came back to me I kept saying oh, no I want to change it uh, I, if I'm unreasonable that would be a way not to cooperate or to try to avoid paying their commission that would be a breach of the duty of cooperation and then probably the last ones people have familiarity with um, as an employee your employer should provide you with safe working conditions so those are the duties both ways. Next time we'll delve in. We've